chapter one of sowing and reaping this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org sowing and reaping by francis e w harper chapter one i hear that john andrews has given up his saloon and a foolish thing it was he was doing a splendid business what could have induced him they say that his wife was bitterly opposed to the business i don't know but i think it quite likely she has never seemed happy since john has kept saloon well i would never let any woman lead me by the nose i would let her know that as the living comes by me the way of getting it is my affair not hers as long as she is well provided for all men are not alike and i confess that i value the peace and happiness of my home more than anything else and i would not like to engage in any business which i knew was a source of constant pain to my wife but what right has a woman to complain if she has everything she wants i would let her know pretty soon who holds the reins if i had such an unreasonable creature to deal with i think as much of my wife as any man but i want her to know her place and i know mine what do you call her place i call her place staying at home and attending to her own affairs were i a labouring man i would never want my wife to take in work when a woman has too much on hand something has to be neglected now i always furnish my wife with sufficient help and supply every want but how i get the living and where i go and what company i keep is my own business and i would not allow the best woman in the world to interfere i have often heard women say that they did not care what their husbands did so that they provided for them and i think such conclusions are very sensible well john i do not think so i think a woman must be very selfish if all she cares for her husband is to have a good provider i think her husband's honour and welfare should be as dear to her as her own and no true woman and wife can be indifferent to the moral welfare of her husband neither man nor woman can live by bread alone in the highest and best sense of the term now paul don't go to preaching you have always got some moonstruck theories some wild visionary and impracticable ideas which would work first-rate if men were angels and earth a paradise now don't be so serious old fellow but you know on this religious business you and i always part company you are always up in the clouds while i am trying to invest in a few acres or town lots of solid terra firma and would your hold on earthly possessions be less firm because you look beyond the seen to the unseen i think it would if i let conscience interfere constantly with every business transaction i undertook now last week you lost five hundred dollars fair and square because you would not foreclose that mortgage on smith's property i told you that business is business and that while i pitied the poor man i would not have risked my money that way but you said that conscience would not let you that while other creditors were gathering like hungry vultures around the poor man you would not join with them and that you did not believe in striking a man when he is down now paul as a business man if you want to succeed you have got to look at business in a practical common-sense way smith is dead and where is your money now apparently lost but the time may come when i shall feel that it was one of the best investments i ever made stranger things than that have happened i confess that i felt the loss and it has somewhat cramped my business yet if it was to do over again i don't think well that i would act differently and when i believe that smith's death was hurried on by anxiety and business troubles while i regret the loss of my money i am thankful that i did not press my claim sour grapes but you are right to put the best face on matters no if it were to do over again i never would push a struggling man to the wall when he was making a desperate fight for his wife and little ones well paul we are both young men just commencing life and my motto is to look out for number one and you oh i believe in lending a helping hand so do i when i can make every corner out to my advantage i believe in every man looking out for himself you will see by the dialogue that the characters i here introduce are the antipodes of each other they have both been pupils in the same school and in after life being engaged as grocers they frequently met and renewed their acquaintance they were both established in business having passed the threshold of that important event setting out in life as far as their outward life was concerned they were acquaintances 
but to each other's inner life they were strangers john anderson has a fine robust constitution good intellectual abilities and superior business faculties he is eager keen and alert and if there is one article of faith that moulds and colours all his life more than anything else it is a firm and unfaltering belief in the main chance he has made up his mind to be rich and his highest ideal of existence may be expressed in four words getting on in life to this object he is ready to sacrifice time talent energy and every faculty which he possesses nay he will go farther he will spend honour conscience and manhood in an eager search for gold he will change his heart into a ledger on which he will write tear and tret and loss and gain exchange and barter and he will succeed as worldly men count success he will add house to house he will encompass the means of luxury his purse will be plethoric but oh how poverty-stricken his soul will be costly viands will please his taste but unappeased hunger will gnaw at his soul amid the blasts of winter he will have the warmth of calcutta in his home and the health of the ocean and the breezes of the mountains shall fan his brow amid the heats of summer but there will be a coolness in his soul that no breath of summer can ever dispel a fever in his spirit that no frozen confection can ever allay he shall be rich in lands and houses but fear of loss and a sense of poverty will poison the fountains of his life and unless he repent he shall go out into the eternities a pauper and a bankrupt paul clifford whom we have also introduced to you was the only son of a widow whose young life had been overshadowed by the curse of intemperance her husband a man of splendid abilities and magnificent culture had fallen a victim to the wine cup with true womanly devotion she had clung to him in the darkest hours until death had broken his hold in life and he was laid away the wreck of his former self in a drunkard's grave gathering up the remains of what had been an ample fortune she installed herself in an humble and unpretending home in the suburbs of the city of b and there with loving solicitude she had watched over and superintended the education of her only son he was a promising boy full of life and vivacity having inherited much of the careless joyousness of his father's temperament and although he was the light and joy of his own yet his mother sometimes felt as if her heart was contracting with a spasm of agony when she remembered that it was through that same geniality of disposition and wonderful fascination of manner the tempter had woven his meshes for her husband and that the qualities that made him so desirable at home made him equally so to his jovial careless inexperienced companions fearful that the appetite for strong drink might have been transmitted to her child as a fatal legacy of sin she sedulously endeavoured to develop within him self-control feeling that the lack of it is a prolific cause of misery and crime and she spared no pains to create within his mind a horror of intemperance and when he was old enough to understand the nature of a vow she knelt with him in earnest prayer and pledging him to eternal enmity against everything that would intoxicate whether fermented or distilled in the morning she sowed the seed which she hoped would blossom in time and bear fruit throughout eternity End of chapter one chapter two of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the decision i hear bell said jeanette roland addressing her cousin bell gordon that you have refused an excellent offer of marriage who said so aunt emma i'm very sorry that ma told you i think such things should be kept sacred from comment and i think the woman is wanting in refinement and delicacy of feeling who makes the rejection of a lover a theme for conversation now you dear little prude i had no idea that you would take it so seriously but aunt emma was so disappointed and spoke of the rejected suitor in such glowing terms and said that you had sacrificed a splendid opportunity because of some squeamish notions on the subject of temperance and so of course my dear cousin it was just like me to let my curiosity overstep the bounds of prudence and inquire why you rejected mr romaine because i could not trust him couldn't trust him why bell you are a greater enigma than ever why not because i feel that the hands 
of a moderate drinker are not steady enough to hold my future happiness was that all why i breathe again we girls would have to refuse almost every young man in our set were we to take that stand and suppose you were would that be any greater misfortune than to be the wives of drunkards i don't see the least danger ma has wine at her entertainments and i have often handed it to young gentlemen and i don't see the least harm in it on last new year's day we had more than fifty callers ma and i handed wine to every one of them oh i do wish people would abandon that pernicious custom of handing around wine on new year's day i do think it is a dangerous and reprehensible thing wherein lies the danger of course i do not approve of young men drinking in bar-rooms and saloons but i cannot see any harm in handing round wine at social gatherings not to do so would seem so odd it is said jeanette he is a slave who does not be in the right with two or three it is better wiser far to stand alone in our integrity than to join with the multitude in doing wrong you say while you do not approve of young men drinking in bar-rooms and saloons that you have no objection to their drinking beneath the shadow of their homes why do you object to their drinking in saloons and bar-rooms because it is vulgar oh i think these bar-rooms are horrid places i would walk squares out of my way to keep from passing them and i object to intemperance not simply because i think it is vulgar but because i know it is wicked and jeanette i have a young brother for whose welfare i am constantly trembling but i am not afraid that he will take his first glass of wine in a fashionable saloon or flashy gin palace but i do dread his entrance into what you call our set i fear that my brother has received as an inheritance a temperament which will be easily excited by stimulants that an appetite for liquor once awakened will be hard to subdue and i am so fearful that at some social gathering a thoughtless girl will hand him a glass of wine and that the first glass will be like adding fuel to a smouldering fire oh bell do stop what a train of horrors you can conjure out of an innocent glass of wine anything can be innocent that sparkles to betray that charms at first but later will bite like an adder and sting like a serpent really bell if you keep on at this rate you will be a monomaniac on the temperance question however i do not think mr romaine will feel highly complimented to know that you refused him because you dreaded he might become a drunkard you surely did not tell him so yes i did and i do not think that i would have been a true friend to him had i not done so oh bell i never could have had the courage to have told him so why not i would have dreaded hurting his feelings were you not afraid of offending him i certainly shrank from the pain which i knew i must inflict but because i valued his welfare more than my own feelings i was constrained to be faithful to him i told him that he was drifting where he ought steer that instead of holding the helm and rudder of his young life he was floating down the stream and unless he stood firmly on the side of temperance that i never would clasp hands with him for life but bell perhaps you have done him more harm than good maybe you could have effected his reformation by consenting to marrying him jeanette were i the wife of a drunken man i do not think there is any depth of degradation that i would not fathom with my love and pity in trying to save him i believe i would cling to him if even his own mother shrank from him but i never would consent to marry any man whom i knew to be unsteady in his principles and a moderate drinker if his love for me and respect for himself were not strong enough to reform him before marriage i should despair of effecting it afterwards and with me in such a case discretion would be the better part of valour and so you have given mr romaine a release yes he is free and i think you have thrown away a splendid opportunity i don't think so the risk was too perilous oh jeanette i know by mournful and bitter experience what it means to dwell beneath the shadow of a home cursed by intemperance i know what it is to see that shadow deepen into the darkness of a drunkard's grave and i dare not run the fearful risk 
and yet bell this has cost you a great deal i can see it in the wanness of your face in your eyes which in spite of yourself are filled with sudden tears i know from the intonations of your voice that you are suffering intensely yes jeanette i confess it was like tearing up the roots of my life to look at this question fairly and squarely in the face and to say no but i must learn to suffer and be strong i am deeply pained it is true but i do not regret the steps i have taken the man who claims my love and allegiance must be a victor and not a slave the reeling brain of a drunkard is not a safe foundation on which to build up a new home well bell you may be right but i think i would have risked it i don't think because mr romaine drinks occasionally that i would have given him up oh young men will sow their wild oats and as we sow so must we reap and as to saying about young men sowing their wild oats i think it is full of pernicious license a young man has no more right to sow his wild oats than a young woman god never made one code of ethics for a man and another for a woman and it is the duty of all true women to demand of men the same standard of morality that they do of woman ah bell that is very fine in theory but you would find it rather difficult if you tried to reduce your theory to practice all that may be true but the difficulty of a duty is not a valid excuse for its non-performance my dear cousin it is not my role to be a reformer i take things as i find them and drift along the tide of circumstances and is that your highest ideal of life why jeanette such a life is not worth living whether it is or not i am living it and i rather enjoy it your vexing problems of life never disturb me i do not think i am called to turn this great world right side up with care and so i float along singing as i go i would be a butterfly born in a bower kissing every rose that is pleasant and sweet i would never languish for wealth or for power i would never sigh to have slaves at my feet such a life would never suit me life must mean to me more than ease luxury and indulgence it must mean aspiration and consecration endeavour and achievement well bell should we live twenty years longer i would like to meet you and see by comparing notes which of us shall have gathered the most sunshine or shadow from life yes jeanette we will meet in less than twenty years but before then your glad light eyes will be dim with tears and the easy path you have striven to walk will be thickly strewn with thorn and whether you deserve it or not life will have for you a mournful earnestness but notwithstanding all your frivolity and flippancy there is fine gold in your character which the fire of affliction only will reveal End of chapter two chapter four of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four how is business very dull i am losing terribly any prospect of times brightening i don't see my way out clear but i hope there will be a change for the better confidence has been greatly shaken men of business have grown exceedingly timid about investing and there is a general depression in every department of trade and business now paul will you listen to reason and common sense i have a proposition to make i am about to embark in a profitable business and i know that it will pay better than anything else i could undertake in these times men will buy liquor if they have not got money for other things i am going to open a first-class saloon and club-house on m street and if you will join with me we can make a splendid thing of it why just see how well off joe harden is since he set up in the business and what airs he does put on i know when he was not worth fifty dollars and kept a little low groggery on the corner of l and s streets but he is out of that now keeps a first-class cafe and owns a block of houses now paul here is a splendid chance for you business is dull and now except this opening of course i mean to keep a first-class saloon i don't intend to tolerate loafing or disorderly conduct or to sell to drunken men in fact i shall put up my scale of prices so that you need fear no annoyance from rough low boisterous men who don't know how to behave themselves what say you paul i say no i wouldn't engage in such a business not if it paid me a hundred thousand dollars a year i think these first-class saloons are just as great a curse to the community as the low groggeries and i look upon them as the fountain-heads of the low groggeries the man who begins to drink in the well-lighted and splendidly furnished saloon is in danger of finishing in the lowest ends of vice and shame as you please said john anderson stiffly i thought that as business is dull 
that i would show you a chance that would yield you a handsome profit but if you refuse there is no harm done i know young men who would jump at the chance you may think it strange that knowing paul clifford as john anderson did that he should propose to him an interest in a drinking saloon but john anderson was a man who was almost destitute of faith in human goodness his motto was that every man has his price and as business was fairly dull and paul was somewhat cramped for want of capital he thought a good business investment would be the price for paul clifford's conscientious scruples anderson said paul looking him calmly in the face you may call me visionary and impracticable but i am determined however poor i may be never to engage in any business on which i cannot ask god's blessing and john i am sorry from the bottom of my heart that you have concluded to give up your grocery and keep a saloon you cannot keep that saloon without sending a flood of demoralizing influence over the community your profit will be the loss of others young men will form in that saloon habits which will curse and overshadow all their lives husbands and fathers will waste their time and money and confirm themselves in habits which will bring misery crime and degradation and the fearful outcome of your business will be broken-hearted wives neglected children outcast men blighted characters and worse than wasted lives no not for the wealth of the indies would i engage in such a ruinous business and i am thankful to-day that i had a dear sainted mother who taught me that it was better to have my hands clear than to have them full how often would she lay her dear hands upon my head and clasp my hands in hers and say paul i want you to live so that you can always feel that there is no eye before whose glance you will shrink no voice from whose tones your heart will quail because your hands are not clean or your record not pure and i feel glad to-day that the precepts and example of that dear mother have given tone and colouring to my life and though she has been in her grave for many years her memory and her words are still to me and ever-present inspiration yes paul i remember your mother i wish oh well there is no use wishing but if all christians were like her i would have more faith in their religion but john the failure of others is no excuse for our own derelictions well i suppose not it is said the way jerusalem was kept clean every man swept before his own door and so you will not engage in the business no john no money i would earn would be the least inducement how foolish said john anderson to himself as they parted there is a young man who might succeed splendidly if he would only give up some of his old-fashioned notions and launch out into life as if he had some common sense if business remains as it is i think he will find out before long that he has got to shut his eyes and swallow down a great many things he don't like after the refusal of paul clifford john soon found a young man of facile conscience who was willing to join with him in a conspiracy of sin against the peace happiness and welfare of the community and he spared neither pains nor expense to make his saloon attractive to what he called the young bloods of the city and by these he meant young men whose parents were wealthy and whose sons had more leisure and spending money than was good for them he succeeded in fitting up a magnificent palace of sin night after night till morning flashed the orient eager and anxious men sat over the gaming-table watching the turn of a card or the throw of a dice sparkling champagne or ruby-tinted wine were served in beautiful and costly glasses rich divans and easy chairs invited weary men to seek repose from unnatural excitement occasionally women entered that saloon but they were women not as god had made them but as sin had debased them women whose costly jewels and magnificent robes were the livery of sin the outside garnishing of moral death the flush upon whose cheek was not the flush of happiness and the light in their eyes was not the sparkle of innocent joy women whose laughter was sadder than their tears and who were dead while they lived in that house were wine and mirth and revelry but the dead were there men dead to virtue true honour and rectitude who walked the streets as other men laughed chatted bought sold exchanged and bartered but whose souls were encased in living tombs bodies that were dead to righteousness but alive to sin like a spider weaving its meshes around the unwary fly john anderson wove his network of sin around the young men that entered his saloon 
before they entered there it was pleasant to see the supple vigour and radiant health that were manifested in the poise of their bodies the lightness of their eyes the freshness of their lips and the bloom upon their cheeks but oh it was so sad to see how soon the manly gait would change to the drunkard's stagger to see eyes once bright with intelligence growing vacant and confused and giving place to the drunkard's fleer in many cases lassitude supplanted vigour and sickness overmastered health but the saddest thing was the fearful power that appetite had gained over its victims and though nature lifted her signals of distress and sent her warnings through weakened nerves and disturbed functions and although they were wasting money time talents and health ruining their characters and alienating their friends and bringing untold agony to hearts that loved them and yearned over their defections yet the fascination grew stronger and ever and anon the grave opened at their feet and disguised it as loving friends might the seeds of death had been nourished by the fiery waters of alcohol End of chapter four chapter six of sowing and reaping by francis e w maharper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six for a few days the most engrossing topic in a p was what shall i wear and what will you wear there was an amount of shopping to be done and dressmakers to be consulted and employed before the great event of the season came off at length the important evening arrived and in the home of mr glossop a wealthy and retired whisky dealer there was a brilliant array of wealth and fashion could all the misery his liquor had caused been turned into blood there would have been enough to have oozed in great drops from every marble ornament or beautiful piece of fresco that adorned his home for that home with its beautiful surroundings and costly furniture was the price of blood but the glamour of his wealth was in the eyes of his guests and they came to be amused and entertained and not to moralise on his ill-gotten wealth the wine flowed out in unstinted measures and some of the women so forgot themselves as to attempt to rival the men in drinking the barrier being thrown down charles drank freely till his tones began to thicken and his eye to grow muddled and he sat down near jeanette and tried to converse but he was too much under the influence of liquor to hold a sensible and coherent conversation oh charlie you naughty boy that wine has got into your head and you don't know what you are talking about well miss jenny i believe you're about half right my head does feel funny i shouldn't wonder mine feels rather dizzy and miss thomas has gone home with a sick headache and i know what her headaches mean said jeanette significantly my head said mary gladstone really feels as big as a bucket and i feel real dizzy said another and so do i said another i feel as if i could hardly stand i feel awful weak why girls you are all all tipsy now just own right up and be done with it said charles romaine why charlie you are as good as a wizard i believe we have all got too much wine aboard but we are not as bad as the girls of b s for they succeeded in out drinking the men i heard the men drank eight bottles of wine and they drank sixteen alas for these young people they were sporting upon the verge of a precipice but its slippery edge was concealed by flowers they were playing with the firebrands of death and thought they were roman candles and harmless rockets good morning bell said jeanette rowland to her cousin bell as she entered her cousin's sitting-room the morning after the party and found jeanette lounging languidly upon the sofa good morning it is a lovely day why are you not out enjoying the fresh air can't you put on your things and go shopping with me i think you have excellent taste and i often want to consult it well after all then i am of some account in your eyes of course you are who said you were not oh nobody only i had an idea that you thought that i was as useless as a canary bird i don't think that a canary bird is at all a useless thing it charms our ears with its song and pleases our eye with its beauty and i am a firm believer in the utility of beauty but can you or rather will you not go with me 
oh bell i would but i am as sleepy as a cat what's the matter i was up so late last night at mrs glossop's party but really it was a splendid affair everything was in the richest profusion and their house is magnificently furnished oh bell i wish you could have been there i don't there are two classes of people with whom i never wish to associate or number as my especial friends and they are rum sellers and slaveholders oh well mr glossop is not in the business now and what is the use of talking about the past don't be always remembering a man's sins against him would you say the same of a successful pirate who could fare sumptuously from the effects of his piracy no i would not but bell the cases is not at all parallel not entirely one commits his crime against society within the pale of the law the other commits his outside they are both criminals against the welfare of humanity one murders the body and the other stabs the soul if i knew that mr glossop was sorry for having been a liquor dealer and was bringing forth fruits meet for repentance i would be among the first to hail his reformation with heartfelt satisfaction but when i hear that while he no longer sells liquor that he constantly offers it to his guests i feel that he should rather sit down in sackcloth and ashes than fireside at sumptuous feasts obtained by liquor selling when crime is sanctioned by law and upheld by custom and fashion it assumes its most dangerous phase and there is often a fearful fascination in the sin that is environed by success oh bell do stop i really think that you will go crazy on the subject of temperance i think you must have written these lines that i have picked up somewhere let me see what they are tell me not that i hate the bowl hate is a feeble word no jeanette i did not write them but i have felt all the writer has so nervously expressed in my own sorrow darkened home and over my poor father's grave i learned to hate liquor in any form with all the intensity of my nature well it was a good thing you were not at mrs glossop's last night for some of our heads were rather dizzy and i know that mr romaine was out of gear now bell don't look so shocked and pained i'm sorry i told you yes i'm very sorry i had great hopes that mr romaine had entirely given up drinking and i was greatly pained when i saw him take a glass of wine at your solicitation jeanette i think mr romaine feels a newly awakened interest in you and i know that you possess great influence over him i saw it that night when he hesitated when you first asked him to drink and i was so sorry to see that influence oh jeanette instead of being its temptress try and be the angel that keeps his steps if mr romaine ever becomes a drunkard and goes down to a drunkard's grave i cannot help feeling that a large measure of the guilt will cling to your shirts oh bell do stop or you will give me the horrors pa takes wine every day at his dinner and i don't see that he is any worse off for it if charles romaine can't govern himself i can't see how i am to blame for it i think you are to blame for this jeanette and pardon me if i speak plainly when charles romaine was trying to abstain you tempted him to break his resolution and he drank to please you i wouldn't have done so for my right hand they say old coals are easily kindled and i shall be somewhat chary about receiving attention from him if you feel so deeply upon the subject jeanette you entirely misapprehend me because i have ceased to regard mr romaine as a lover does not hinder me from feeling for him as a friend and because i am his friend and yours also i take the liberty to remonstrate against your offering him wine at your entertainments well bell i can't see the harm in it i don't believe there was another soul who refused except you and mr freeman and you are so straight and laced and he is rather green just fresh from the country it won't take him long to get citified citified or countryfied i couldn't help admiring his strength of principle which stood firm in the midst of temptation and would not yield to the blandishments of the hour and so you will not go out with me this morning oh no bell i am too tired won't you excuse me certainly but i must go good morning what a strange creature my cousin bell is said jeanette to herself as miss gordon left the room she will never be like any one else i don't think she will ever get over my offering mr romaine that glass of wine 
i wish she hadn't seen it but i'll try and forget her and go to sleep but jeanette was not destined to have the whole morning for an unbroken sleep soon after bell's departure the bell rang and charles romaine was announced and weary as jeanette was she was too much interested in his society to refuse him and arraying herself in a very tasteful and becoming manner she went down to receive him in the parlour end of chapter six chapter seven of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven very pleasant was the reception jeanette roland gave mr romaine there was no reproof upon her lips nor implied censure in her manner true he had been disguised by liquor or to use a softer phrase had taken too much wine but others had done the same and treated it as a merry escapade and why should she be so particular bell gordon would have acted very differently but then she was not bell and in this instance she did not wish to imitate her bell was so odd and had become very unpopular and besides she wished to be very very pleasant to mr romaine he was handsome agreeable and wealthy and she found it more congenial to her taste to clasp hands with him and float down stream together than help him breast the current of his wrong tendencies and stand firmly on the rock of principle you are looking very sweet but rather pensive this morning said mr romaine noticing a shadow on the bright and beautiful face of jeanette whose colour had deepened by the plain remarks of her cousin bell what is the matter oh nothing much only my cousin bell has been here this morning and she has been putting me on the stool of repentance why what have you been doing that was naughty oh she was perfectly horror-stricken when i told her about the wine we drank and mrs glossop's party i wish i had not said a word to her about it what did she say oh she thought it was awful the way we were going on she made me feel that i did something dreadful when i offered you a glass of wine at ma's silver wedding i don't believe bell ever sees a glass of wine without thinking of murder suicide and a drunkard's grave but we are not afraid of those dreadful things are we jeanette of course not but somehow bell always makes me feel uncomfortable when she begins to talk on temperance she says she is terribly in earnest and i think she is miss gordon and i were great friends once said charles romaine as a shadow flitted over his face and a slight sigh escaped his lips were you why didn't you remain so because she was too good for me that is a very sorry reason but it is true i think miss gordon is an excellent young lady but she and i wouldn't agree on the temperance question the man who marries her has got to toe the mark she ought to be a minister's wife i expect she will be an old maid i don't know but if i were to marry her i should prepare myself to go to church every sunday morning and to stay home in the afternoon and repeat my catechism i would like to see you under her discipline it would come hard on a fellow but i might go farther and fare worse and so you and bell were great friends once yes but as we could not agree on the total abstinence question we parted company how so did you part as lovers part she with a wronged and broken heart and you rejoicing you were free glad to regain you liberty not at all she gave me the mitten and i had to take it were you very sorry yes till i met you oh mr romaine said jeanette blushing and dropping her eyes why not i think i found in your society an ample compensation for the loss of miss gordon but i think bell is better than i am i sometimes wish i was half so good you are good enough for me bell is very good but somehow her goodness makes a fellow uncomfortable she is what i call distressingly good one doesn't want to be treated like a wild beast in a menagerie and to be every now and then stirred up with a long stick what a comparison well it is a fact when a fellow has been busy all day poring over coke and blackstone or casting up wearisome rows of figures and seeks a young lady's society in the evening 
he wants to enjoy himself to bathe in the sunshine of her smiles and not to be lectured about his shortcomings i tell you jeanette it comes hard on a fellow you want some one to smooth the wrinkles out of the brow of care and not to add fresh ones yes and i hope it will be my fortune to have a fair soft hand like this said mr romaine slightly pressing jeanette's hand to perform the welcome and agreeable task bell's hand would be firmer than mine for the talk it is not the strong hand but the tender hand i want in a woman but bell is very kind she did it all for your own good of course she did my father used to say so when i was a boy and he corrected me but it didn't make me enjoy the correction it is said our best friends are those who show us our faults and teach us how to correct them my best friend is a dear sweet girl who sits by my side who always welcomes me with a smile and beguiles me so with her conversation that i take no note of the hours until the striking of the clock warns me it is time to leave and i should ask no higher happiness than to be permitted to pass all the remaining hours of my life at her side can i dare to hope for such a happy fortune a bright flush overspread the cheek of jeanette roland there was a sparkle of joy in her eyes as she seemed intently examining the flowers on her mother's carpet and she gently referred him to papa for an answer in due time mr roland was interviewed his consent obtained and jeanette roland and charles romaine were affianced lovers girls have you heard the news said miss tabitha jones a pleasant and wealthy spinster to a number of young girls who were seated at her tea-table no what is it i hear mr romaine is to be married next spring to whom jeanette roland well i do declare i thought he was engaged to bell gordon i thought so too but it is said that she refused him but i don't believe it i don't believe that she had a chance well i do why did she refuse him because he would occasionally take too much wine but he is not a drunkard but she dreads that he will be well i think it is perfectly ridiculous i gave bell credit for more common sense i think he was one of the most eligible gentlemen in our set wealthy handsome and agreeable what could have possessed bell i think he is perfectly splendid yes said another girl i think bell stood very much in her own light she is not rich and if she would marry him she could have everything heart could wish what a silly girl you wouldn't catch me throwing away such a chance i think said miss tabitha that instead of miss gordon's being a silly girl that she has acted both sensibly and honourably in refusing to marry a man she could not love no woman should give her hand where she cannot yield her heart but miss tabitha the strangest thing to me is that i really believe that bell gordon cares more for mr romaine than she does for any one else her face was a perfect study that night at mrs rowland's party how so they say that after miss gordon requested mr romaine that for a while he scrupulously abstained from taking even a glass of wine at several entertainments he adhered to this purpose but on the evening of mrs rowland's silver wedding jeanette succeeded in persuading him to take a glass in honour of the occasion i watched bell's face and it was a perfect study every nerve seemed quivering with intense anxiety once i think she reached out her hand unconsciously as if to snatch away the glass and when at last he yielded i saw the light fade from her eyes a deadly pallor overspread her cheek and i thought at one time she was about to faint but she did not and only laid her head upon her side as if to allay a sudden spasm of agony End of chapter seven chapter eight of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight paul clifford sat at his ledger with a perplexed and anxious look it was near two o'clock and his note was in bank if he could not raise five hundred dollars by three o'clock that note would be protested money was exceedingly hard to raise and he was about despairing once he thought of applying to john anderson but he said to himself no i will not touch his money for it is the price of blood for he did not wish to owe gratitude where he did not feel respect 
it was now five minutes past two o'clock and in less than an hour his note would be protested unless relief came from some unexpected quarter is mr clifford in said a full manly voice paul suddenly roused from his painful reflections answered yes come in good morning sir what can i do for you this morning i have come to see you on business i am at your service said paul do you remember said the young man of having aided an unfortunate friend more than a dozen years since by lending him five hundred dollars yes i remember he was an old friend of mine a schoolmate of my father's charles smith well i am his son and i have come to liquidate my father's debt here is the money with interest for twelve years paul's heart gave a sudden bound of joy strong man as he was a mist gathered in his eyes as he reached out his hand to receive the thrice welcome sum he looked at the clock it was just fifteen minutes to three will you walk with me to the bank or wait till i return i will wait said james smith taking up the morning paper you are just in time mr clifford said the banker smiling and bowing as paul entered i was afraid your note would be protested but it is all right yes said paul the money market is very tight but i think i shall weather the storm i hope so you may have to struggle hard for a while to keep your head above the water but you must take it for your motto that there is no such word as fail thank you good morning well mr smith said paul when he returned your father and mine were boys together he was several years younger than my father and a great favourite in our family among the young folks about twelve years since when i had just commenced business i lent him five hundred dollars and when his business troubles became complicated i refused to foreclose a mortgage which i had on his home an acquaintance of mine sneered at my lack of business keenness and predicted that my money would be totally lost when i told him perhaps it was the best investment i ever made he smiled incredulously and said i would rather see it than hear of it but i will say that in all my business career i never received any money that came so opportune as this it reminds me of those stories that i have read in fairy books people so often fail in paying their own debts it seems almost a mystery to me that you should pay a debt contracted by your father when you were but a boy the clue to this mystery has been the blessed influence of my sainted mother and a flush of satisfaction mantled his cheek as he referred to her after my father's death my mother was very poor when she looked into the drawer there were only sixty cents in money of course he had some personal property but it was not immediately available like money but through the help of kind friends she was enabled to give him a respectable funeral like many other women in her condition of life she had been brought up in entire ignorance of managing any other business than that which belonged to her household for years she had been shielded in the warm clasp of loving arms but now she had to bare her breast to the storm and be father and mother both to her little ones my father as you know died in debt and he was hardly in his grave when his creditors were upon her track i have often heard her speak in the most grateful manner of your forbearance and kindness to her in her hour of trouble my mother went to see my father's principal creditor and asked him only to give her a little time to straighten out the tangled threads of her business but he was inexorable and said that he had waited and lost by it very soon he had an administrator appointed by the court who in about two months 
took the business in his hands and my mother was left to struggle along with her little ones and face an uncertain future these were dark days but we managed to live through them i have often heard her say that she lived by faith and not sight that poverty had its compensations that there was something very sweet in a life of simple trust to her god was not some far-off and unapproachable force in the universe the unconscious creator of all consciousness the unperceiving author of all perception but a friend and a father coming near to her in sorrows taking cognizance of her grief and gently smoothing her path in life but it was not only by precept that she taught us her life was a living epistle one morning as the winter was advancing and i heard her say she hoped she would be able to get a nice woollen shawl as hers was getting worse for wear shortly after i went out into the street and found a roll of money lying at my feet oh i remember it as well as if it had just occurred how my heart bounded with joy here i said to myself is money enough to buy mother a shawl and bonnet oh i am so glad and hurrying home i laid it in her lap and said with boyish glee hurrah for your new shawl look what i found in the street what is it my son she said why here is money enough to buy you a new shawl and bonnet too it seems as if i see her now as she looked when she laid it aside and said but james it is not ours not ours mother why i found it in the street still it is not ours why mother ain't you going to keep it no my son i shall go down to the clarion office and advertise it but mother why not wait till it is advertised and what then if there is no owner for it then we can keep it james she said calmly and sadly i am very sorry to see you so ready to use what is not your own i should not feel that i was dealing justly if i kept this money without endeavouring to find the owner i confess that i was rather chop-fallen at her decision but in a few days after advertising we found the rightful owner she was a very poor woman who had saved by dint of hard labour the sum of twenty dollars and was on her way to pay the doctor who had attended her during a spell of rheumatic fever when she lost the money and had not one dollar left to pay for advertising and being disheartened she had given up all hope of finding it when she happened to see it advertised in the paper she was very grateful to my mother for restoring the money and offered her some compensation but she refused to take it saying she had only done her duty and would have been ashamed of herself had she not done so her conduct on this occasion made an impression on my mind that has never been erased when i grew older she explained to me about my father's affairs and uncancelled debts and i resolved that i would liquidate every just claim against him and take from his memory even the shadow of a reproach to this end i have laboured late and early to-day i have paid the last claim against him and i am a free man but how came you to find me and pay me to-day i was purchasing in jones and brothers store when you came in to borrow money and i heard jones tell his younger brother that he was so sorry that he could not help you and feared that you would be ruined who is he said i for out west i have lost track of you he is paul clifford a friend of your father's can you help him he is perfectly reliable 
we would trust him with ten thousand dollars if we had it can you do anything for him we will go his security he is a fine fellow and we hate to see him go under yes said i he was one of my father's creditors and i have often heard my mother speak of his generosity to her little ones and i am glad that i have the privilege of helping him i immediately went to the bank had a note cashed and i am very glad if i have been of any special service to you you certainly have been and i feel that a heavy load had been lifted from my heart years ago paul clifford sowed the seeds of kindness and they were yielding him a harvest of satisfaction in the chapter eight chapter nine of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine bell gordon bell gordon was a christian she had learned or tried to realize what is meant by the apostle paul when he said ye are bought with a price to her those words meant the obligation she was under to her heavenly father for the goodness and mercy that had surrounded her life for the patience that had borne with her errors and sins and above all for the gift of his dear son the ever blessed christ faith to her was not a rich traditional inheritance a set of formulated opinions received without investigation and adopted without reflection she could not believe because others did and however plausible or popular a thing might be she was too conscientious to say she believed it if she did not and when she became serious on the subject of religion it was like entering into a wilderness of doubt and distress she had been taught to look upon god more as the great and dreadful god than as the tender loving father of his human children and so strong was the power of association that she found it hard to believe that god is good and yet until she could believe this there seemed to be no resting place for her soul but in course of time the shadows were lifted from her life faith took the place of doubting and in the precious promises of the bible she felt that her soul had found a safe and sure anchorage if others believed because they had never doubted she believed because she had doubted and her doubts had been dispelled by the rays of heaven and believing she had entered into rest feeling that she was bought with a price she realized that she was not her own but the captive of divine love and that her talents were not given her to hide beneath a bushel or to use for merely selfish enjoyments that her time was not her own to be frittered away by the demands of fashion or to be spent in unavailing regrets every reform which had for its object the lessening of human misery or the increase of human happiness found in her an earnest ally on the subject of temperance she was terribly in earnest every fibre of her heart responded to its onward movement there was no hut or den where human beings congregated that she felt was too vile or too repulsive to enter if by so doing she could help lift some fallen soul out of the depths of sin and degradation while some doubted the soundness of her religious opinions none doubted the orthodoxy of her life little children in darkened homes smiled at the sunlight of her presence as the sunlight of her presence came over their paths reformed men looked upon her as a loving counsellor and faithful friend and sister women wretched and sorrowful dragged down from love and light by the intemperance of their husbands brought to her their heavy burdens and by her sympathy and tender consideration she helped them bear them she was not rich in this world's goods but she was affluent in tenderness sympathy and love and out of the fullness of her heart she was a real minister of mercy among the poor and degraded believing that the inner life developed the outer she considered the poor and strove to awaken within them self-reliance and self-control feeling that one of the surest ways to render people helpless or dangerous 
is to crush out their self-respect and self-reliance she thought it one of the greatest privileges of her life to be permitted to scatter flowers by the wayside of life other women might write beautiful poems she did more she made her life a thing of brightness and beauty do you think she will die said bell gordon bending tenderly over a pale and fainting woman whose face in spite of its attenuation showed traces of great beauty not if she is properly cared for she has fainted from exhaustion brought on by overwork and want of proper food tears gathered in the eyes of bell gordon as she lifted the beautiful head upon her lap and chafed the pale hands to bring back warmth and circulation let her be removed to her home as soon as possible said the doctor the air is too heavy and damp for her i wonder where she lives said bell thoughtfully scanning her face as the features began to show returning animation round the corner said an urchin she's joe cough's wife i seed her going down the street with a great big bundle and ma'am said she looked like she was going to topple over where is her husband i don't know i spect he's down to jim green's saloon what does he do he don't do nothin but ma'am says she works awful hard come this way said he with a quickness gathered by his constant contact with street life up two flights of rickety stairs they carried the wasted form of mary gough and laid her tenderly upon a clean but very poor bed in spite of her extreme poverty there was an air of neatness in the desolate room bell looked around and found an old teapot in which there were a few leaves there were some dry crusts in the cupboard while two little children crouched by the embers in the grate and cried for the mother bell soon found a few coals in an old basin with which she replenished the fire and covering up the sick woman as carefully as she could stepped into the nearest grocery and replenished her basket with some of good the things of life is it not too heavy for you for your might said paul clifford from whose grocery bell had bought her supplies can i not send them home for you no i don't want them sent home they are for a poor woman and her suffering children who live about a square from here in lear's court paul stood thoughtfully a moment before handing her the basket and said that court has a very bad reputation had i not better accompany you i hope you will not consider my offer as an intrusion but i do not think it is safe for you to venture there alone if you think it is not safe i will accept of your company but i never thought of danger for myself in the presence of that fainting woman and her hungry children do you know her her name is mrs gough i think i do if it is the person i mean i remember her when she was as light-hearted and happy a girl as i ever saw but she married against her parents consent a worthless fellow named joe gough and in a short time she disappeared from the village and i suppose she has come home broken in health and broken in spirit and i am afraid she has come home to die are her parents still alive yes but her father never forgave her her mother i believe would take her to her heart as readily as she ever did but her husband has an iron will and she has got to submit to him where do they live at number two hundred rond street but here we are at the door paul carried the basket upstairs and sat down quietly while bell prepared some refreshing tea and toast for the feeble mother and some bread and milk for the hungry children what shall i do said bell looking tenderly upon the wan face i hate to leave her alone and yet i confess i do not prefer spending the night here of course not said paul looking thoughtfully into the flickering fire of the grate oh i have it now i know a very respectable woman who occasionally cleans out my store just wait a few moments and i think i can find her said paul clifford turning to the door in a short time he returned bringing with him a pleasant-looking woman whose face in spite of the poverty of her dress had a look of genuine refinement which comes not so much from mingling with people of culture as from the culture of her own moral and spiritual nature she had learned to look up and not to look down to lend a helping hand wherever she felt it was needed her life was spent in humble usefulness 
she was poor in this world's goods but rich in faith and good works no poor person who asked her for bread ever went away empty sometimes people would say i wouldn't give him a mouthful he is not worthy and then she would say in the tenderest and sweetest manner suppose our heavenly father only gave to us because we are worthy what would any of us have i know she once said of a miserable sot with whom she shared her scanty food that he is a wretched creature but i wanted to get at his heart and the best way to it was through his stomach i never liked to preach religion to hungry people there is something very beautiful about the charity of the poor they give not as the rich of their abundance but of their limited earnings gifts which when given in a right spirit bring a blessing with them End of chapter nine chapter ten of sowing and reaping by francis c w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten mary gough i think said paul clifford to miss gordon that i have found just the person that will suit you and if you accept i will be pleased to see you safe home bell thanked the young grocer and gratefully accepted his company bell returned the next day to see her protege and found her getting along comfortably although she could not help seeing it was sorrow more than disease that was sapping her life and drying up the feeble streams of existence how do you feel this morning said bell laying her hand tenderly upon her forehead better much better she replied with an attempt at cheerfulness in her voice i am so glad that mother graham is here it is like letting the sunshine into these gloomy rooms to have her around it all seems like a dream to me i remember carrying a large bundle of work to the store that my employer spoke harshly to me and talked of cutting down my wages i also remember turning into the street my eyes almost blinded with tears and that i felt a dizziness in my head the next i remember was seeing a lady feeding my children and a gentleman coming in with auntie graham yes said bell fortunately after i had seen you i met with mr clifford who rendered me every necessary assistance his presence was very opportune just then bell turned her eyes toward the door and saw mr clifford standing on the threshold ah said he smiling and advancing this time the old adage has failed which says that listeners never hear any good of themselves for without intending to act the part of an eavesdropper i heard myself pleasantly complimented no more than you deserve said bell smiling and blushing as she gave him her hand in a very frank and pleasant manner mrs golf is much better this morning and is very grateful to you for your kindness mine said mr clifford if you will call it so was only the result of an accident still i am very glad if i have been of any service and you are perfectly welcome to make demands upon me that will add to mrs gough's comfort thank you i am very glad she has found a friend in you it is such a blessed privilege to be able to help others less fortunate than ourselves it certainly is just a moment said bell as the voice of mrs gough fell faintly on her ear what is it dear said bell bending down to catch her words who is that gentleman his face and voice seem familiar it is mr clifford paul clifford yes do you know him yes i knew him years ago when i was young and happy but it seems an age since oh isn't it a dreadful thing to be a drunkard's wife yes it is but would you like to speak to mr clifford yes ma'am i would mr clifford said bell mrs gough would like to speak with you do you not know me said mary looking anxiously into his face i recognized you as soon as you moved into the neighbourhood i am very glad i feared that i was so changed that my own dear mother would hardly recognise me don't you think she would pity and forgive me if she saw what a mournful wretch i am yes i think she has long forgiven you and longs to take you to her heart as warmly as she ever did and my father i believe he would receive you but i don't think he would be willing to 
recognize your husband you know he is very set in his ways mr clifford i feel that my days are numbered and that my span of life will soon be done but while i live i feel it my duty to cling to my demented husband and to do all i can to turn him from the error of his ways but i do so wish that my poor children could have my mother's care when i am gone if i were satisfied on that score i would die content do not talk of dying said bell taking the pale thin hand in hers you must try and live for your children's sake when you get strong i think i can find you some work among my friends there is mrs roberts she often gives out work and i think i will apply to her mrs james roberts on st james street near sixteenth yes do you know her yes said mrs gough closing her eyes wearily i know her and have worked for her i think she is an excellent woman i remember one morning we were talking together on religious experience and about women speaking in class and conference meetings i said i did not think i should like to constantly relate my experience in public there was often such a lack of assurance of faith about me that i shrank from holding up my inner life to inspection and she replied that she would always say that she loved jesus and i thought oh how i would like to have her experience what rest and peace i would have if i could feel that i was always in harmony with him miss bell i hope you will not be offended with me for i am very ignorant about these matters but there was something about mrs roberts dealings with us poor working people that did seem to me not to be just what i think religion calls for i found her a very hard person to deal with she wanted so much work for so little money but mrs gough the times are very hard and the rich feel it as well as the poor but not so much it curtails them in their luxuries and us in our necessities perhaps i sh shouldn't mention but after my husband had become a confirmed drunkard and all hope had died out of my heart i hadn't time to sit down and brood helplessly over my misery i had to struggle for my children and if possible keep the wolf from the door and besides food and clothing i wanted to keep my children in a respectable neighbourhood and my whole soul rose up in revolt against the idea of bringing them up where their eyes and ears would be constantly smitten by improper sights and sounds while i was worrying over my situation and feeling that my health was failing under the terrible pressure of care and overwork mrs roberts brought me work what will you do this for she said displaying one of the articles she wanted made i replied one dollar and twenty-five cents and i knew the work well worth it i can get it done for one dollar she replied and i am not willing to give any more what could i do i was out of work my health was poor and my children clutching at my heart-strings for bread and so i took it at her price it was very unprofitable but it was better than nothing why that is very strange i know she pays her dressmaker handsomely that is because her dressmaker is in a situation to dictate her own terms but while she would pay her a large sum for dressmaking she would screw and pinch a five-cent piece from one who hadn't power to resist her demands i have seen people save twenty-five or fifty cents in dealing with poor people who would squander ten times as much on some luxury of the table or wardrobe i often find that meanness and extravagance go hand in hand yes that is true still mrs gough i think people often act like mrs roberts more from want of thought than want of heart it was an old charge brought against the israelite my people doth not consider what is the matter my dear said bell a few mornings after this conversation as she approached the bedside of mary gough i thought you were getting along so nicely and that with proper care you would be on your feet in a few days but this morning you look so feeble and seem so nervous and depressed do tell me what has happened and what has become of your beautiful hair oh you had such a wealth of tresses i really love to toy with them was your head so painful that the doctor ordered them to be cut 
oh no she said burying her face in the pillow and breaking into a paroxysm of tears oh miss bell how can i tell you she replied recovering from her sudden outburst of sorrow why what is it darling i am at a loss to know what has become of your beautiful hair with gentle womanly tact bell saw that the loss of her hair was a subject replete with bitter anguish and turning to the children she took them in her lap and interested and amused them by telling beautiful fairy stories in a short time mary's composure returned and she said miss bell i can now tell you how i lost my hair last night my husband or the wreck of what was once my husband came home his eyes were wild and bloodshot his face was pale and haggard his gait uneven and his hand trembling i have seen him suffering from mana power too and dreaded lest he should have a returning of it mrs graham had just stepped out and there was no one here but myself and children he held in his hand a pair of shears and approached my bedside i was ready to faint with terror when he exclaimed mary i must have liquor or i shall go wild he caught my hair in his hand i was too feeble to resist and in a few minutes he had cut every lock from my head and left it just as you see it oh what a pity and what a shame oh miss gordon do you think the men who make our laws ever stop to consider the misery crime and destruction that flow out of the liquor traffic i have done all i could to induce him to abstain and he has abstained several months at a time and then suddenly like a flash of lightning the temptation returns and all his resolutions are scattered like chaff before the wind i have been blamed for living with him but miss bell were you to see him in his moments of remorse and hear his bitter self-reproach and his earnest resolutions to reform you would as soon leave a drowning man to struggle alone in the water as to forsake him in his weakness when every one else has turned against him and if i can be the means of saving him the joy for his redemption will counterbalance all that i have suffered as a drunkard's wife End of chapter ten chapter thirteen of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen john anderson's saloon the end of these things is death why do you mix that liquor with such care and give it to that child you know he is not going to pay you for it i am making an investment how so why you see that boy's parents are very rich and in course of time he will be one of my customers well john anderson as old a sinner as i am i wouldn't do such a thing for my right hand what's the harm you are one of my best customers did liquor ever harm you yes it does harm me and when i see young men beginning to drink i feel like crying out young man you are in danger don't put your feet in the terrible flood for ten to one you will be swamped well this is the best joke of the season tom carey preaching temperance when do you expect to join the crusade but oh talk is cheap cheap or dear john anderson when i saw you giving liquor to that innocent boy i couldn't help thinking of my poor charlie he was just such a bright child as that with beautiful brown eyes and a fine forehead ah that boy had a mind he was always ahead in his studies but once when he was about twelve years old i let him go on a travelling tour with his uncle he was so agreeable and wide awake his uncle liked to have him for company but it was a dear trip to my poor charlie during this journey they stopped at a hotel and my brother gave him a glass of wine better for my dear boy had he given him a glass of strychnine that one glass awakened within him a dreadful craving 
it raged like a hungry fire i talked to him his mother pled with him but it was no use liquor was his master and when he couldn't get liquor i've known him to break into his pantry to get our burning fluid to assuage his thirst sometimes he would be sober for several weeks at a time and then our hopes would brighten that charlie would be himself again and then in an hour all our hopes would be dashed to the ground it seemed as if a spell was upon him he married a dear good girl who was as true as steel but all her entreaties for him to give up drinking were like beating the air he drank and drank until he drank himself into the grave by this time two or three loungers had gathered around john anderson and thomas gary and one of them said mr gary you have had sad experience why don't you give up drinking yourself give it up because i can't to-day i would give one half of my farm if i could pass by this saloon and not feel that i wanted to come in no i feel that i am a slave there was a time when i could have broken my chain but it is too late now and i say young men take warning by me and don't make slaves and fools of yourselves now tom carey said john anderson it is time for you to dry up we have had enough of this foolishness if you can't govern yourself the more is the pity for you just then the newsboy came along crying evening mail all about the dreadful murder john coots and james lorraine last edition buy a paper sir here's your last edition all about the dreadful murder john coots said several voices all at once why he's been here a half dozen times to-day i've drank with him said one at that bar twice since noon he had a strange look out of his eyes and i heard him mutter something to himself yes said another i heard him say he was going to kill somebody one or the other's got to die what does the paper say love jealousy and murder the old story said anderson looking somewhat relieved a woman's at the bottom of it and liquor said tom carey is at the top of it i wish you would keep a civil tongue in your head said anderson scowling at carey oh never mind tom will have his say he's got a knack of speaking out in meeting and a very disagreeable knack it is oh never mind about tom read about the murder and tend to tom some other time eagerly and excitedly they read the dreadful news a woman frail and vicious was at the bottom a woman that neither of those men would have married as a gracious gift was the guilty cause of one murder and when the law would take its course two deaths would lie at her door oh the folly of some men who instead of striving to make home a thing of beauty strength and grace wander into forbidden pastures and reap for themselves harvests of misery and disgrace and all for what because of the allurements of some idle vain and sinful woman who has armed herself against the peace the purity and the progress of the fireside such women are the dry rot in the social fabric they dig in the dark beneath the foundation stones of the home young men enter their houses and over the mirror of their lives comes the shadow of pollution companionship with them unprepares them for the pure simple joys of a happy and virtuous home a place which should be the best school for the affections one of the fairest spots on earth and one of the brightest types of heaven such a home as this may exist without wealth luxury or display but it cannot exist without the essential elements of purity love and truth the story was read and then came the various comments oh it was dreadful said one mr lorraine belongs to one of the first families in the town and what a cut it will be to them not simply that he has been murdered but murdered where he was in the house of lizzie wilson i knew her before she left husband and took to evil courses oh what a pity i expect it will almost kill his wife poor thing i pity her from the bottom of my heart why what's the matter harry richards you look as white as a sheet and you are all of a tremor i've just come from the coroner's inquest had to be one of the witnesses i'm afraid it will go hard with coots why what was the verdict of the jury they brought in a verdict of death by killing at the hands of john coots were you present at the murder yes how did it happen 
why you see john had been spending his money very freely on lizzie wilson and he took it into his head because lorraine had made her some costly presents that she had treated him rather coolly and wanted to ship him and so he got dreadfully put out with lorraine and made some bitter threats against him but i don't believe he would have done the deed if he had been sober but he's been on a spree for several days and he was half crazy when he did it oh it was heart-rending to see lorraine's wife when they brought him home a corpse she gave an awful shriek and fell to the floor stiff as a poker and his poor little children it made my heart bleed to look at them and his poor old mother i'm afraid it will be the death of her in a large city with its varied interests one event rapidly chases the other lifeboats are stranded on the shores of time pitiful wrecks of humanity are dashed amid the rocks and reefs of existence old faces disappear and new ones take their places and the stream of life ever hurries on to empty where death's waters meet at the next sitting of the court john coutts was arraigned tried and convicted of murder in the first degree his lawyer tried to bring in a plea of emotional insanity but failed if insane he was insane through the influence of strong drink it was proven that he had made fierce threats against the life of lorraine and the liquor in which he had so freely indulged had served to fire his brain and nerve his hand to carry out his wicked intent and so the jury brought in its verdict and he was sentenced to be executed which sentence was duly performed and that closed another act of the sad drama intemperance and sensuality had clasped hands together and beneath their cruel fostering the gallows had borne its dreadful fruit of death the light of one home had been quenched in gloom and guilt a husband had broken over the barriers that god placed around the path of marital love and his son had gone down at midday the sun which should have gilded the horizon of life and lent it additional charms had gone down in darkness yes set behind the shadow of a thousand clouds innocent and unoffending childhood was robbed of a father's care and a once happy wife and joyful mother sat down in her widow's weeds with the mantle of a gloomier sorrow around her heart and all for what oh who will justify the ways of god to man who will impress upon the mind of youth with its impulsiveness that it is a privilege as well as a duty to present the body to god as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable in his sight that god gives man no law that is not for his best advantage and that the interests of humanity and the laws of purity and self-denial all lie in the same direction and the man who does not take care of his body must fail to take the best care of his soul for the body should be temple for god's holy spirit and the instrument to do his work and we have no right to defile the one or blunt the other and thus render ourselves unfit for the master's service End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of sowing and reaping by francis c w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen bell gordon's indignation was thoroughly aroused by hearing mary goff's story about the loss of her hair and she made up her mind that when she saw joe goff she would give him a very plain talking i would like to see your husband i would just like to tell him what i think about his conduct oh said mary her pale cheek growing whiter with apprehension that's his footsteps now miss bell don't say anything to him joe's as good and kind a man as i ever saw when he is sober but sometimes he is really ugly when he has been drinking just then the door was opened and joe goff entered or rather all that remained of the once witty talented and handsome josiah goff his face was pale and haggard and growing premature by age his wealth of raven hair was unkempt and hung in tangled locks over his forehead his hand was unsteady and trembling from extreme nervousness but he was sober enough to comprehend the situation and to feel a deep sense of remorse and shame when he gazed upon the weary head from whence he had bereft its magnificent covering here mary said he approaching the bed i've brought you a present i only had four cents and i thought this would please you i know you women are so fond of jujaws and he handed her a pair of sleeve buttons 
thank you said she as a faint smile illuminated her pallid cheek this she said turning to miss gordon is my husband josiah goff good morning mr goff said bell bowing politely and extending her hand joe returned the salutation very courteously and very quietly sitting down by the bedside made some remarks about the dampness of the weather mary lay very quiet looking pitifully upon the mournful wretch at her side who seemed to regard her and her friend with intense interest it seemed from his countenance that remorse and shame were rousing up his better nature once he rose as if to go stood irresolutely for a moment and then sitting down by the bedside clasped her thin pale hand in his with a caressing motion and said mary you've had a hard time but i hope there are better days in store for us don't get out of heart and there was a moisture in his eyes in which for a moment beamed a tender loving light bell immediately felt her indignation changing to pity surely she thought within herself this man is worth saving there is still love and tenderness within him notwithstanding all his self-ruin he reminds me of an expression i have picked up somewhere about old oak holding the young fibres at his heart i will appeal to that better nature i will use it as a lever to lift him from the depths into which he has fallen while she was thinking of the best way to approach him and how to reach that heart into whose hidden depths she had so unexpectedly glanced he arose and bending over his wife imprinted upon her lips a kiss in which remorse and shame seemed struggling for expression and left the room mother graham said bell a happy thought has just struck me couldn't we induce mr goff to attend the meeting of the reform club mr r n speaks to-night and he has been meeting with glorious success as a temperance reformer hundreds of men many of them confirmed drunkards have joined and he is doing a remarkable work he does not wait for the drunkards to come to him he goes to them and wins them by his personal sympathy and it is wonderful the good he has done i do wish he would go i wish so too said martha graham if he should not return while i am here will you invite him to attend perhaps mrs golf can spare you an hour or two this evening to accompany him that i would gladly do i think it would do me more good than all the medicines you could give me to see my poor husband himself once more before he took to drinking i was so happy but it seems as if since then i have suffered sorrow by the spoonful oh the misery that this drink causes i do hope these reform clubs will be the means of shutting up every saloon in the place for just as long as one of them is open he is in danger yes said bell what we need is not simply to stop the men from drinking but to keep the temptation out of their way joe said mary belongs to a good family he has a first-rate education is a fine penman and a good bookkeeper but this dreadful drink has thrown him out of some of the best situations in the town where we were living oh what a pity i heard mr clifford say that his business was increasing so that he wanted a good clerk and salesman to help him that he was overworked and crippled for want of sufficient help maybe if your husband would sign the pledge mr clifford would give him a trial but it is growing late and i must go i would have liked to have seen your husband before i left and have given him a personal invitation but you and mother graham can invite him for me so good-bye keep up a good heart you know where to cast your burden just as miss gordon reached the landing she saw joe goff standing at the outer door and laying her hand gently upon his shoulder exclaimed oh mr goff i am so glad to see you again i wanted to invite you to attend a temperance meeting to-night at amory hall will you go well i don't like to promise he replied looking down upon his seedy coat and dilapidated shoes never mind your wardrobe said miss gordon divining his thoughts the soul is more than raiment the world has room for another man and i want you to fill the place well said he i'll come very well i expect to be there and will look for you come early and bring mother graham mrs goff can spare her an hour or two this evening i think your wife is suffering more from exhaustion and debility than anything else yes poor mary has had a hard time but it shan't be always so as soon as i get work i mean to take her out of this said he looking disdainfully at the wretched tenement house 
with its broken shutters and look of general decay why mother graham is the meeting over you must have had a fine time you just look delighted did joe go in with you and where is he now yes he went with me listened to the speeches and joined the club i saw him do it with my own eyes oh we had a glorious time oh i am so glad said mary her eyes filling with sudden tears i do hope he will keep his pledge i hope so too and i hope he will get something to do mr clifford was there when he signed and miss bell was saying to-day that he wanted a clerk that would be a first-rate place for joe if he will only keep his pledge mr clifford is an active temperance man and i believe would help to keep joe straight i hope he'll get the place but mother graham tell me all about the meeting you don't know how happy i am don't i dearie have i been through it all but it seems as if i had passed through suffering into peace but never mind mother graham's past troubles let me tell you about the meeting at these meetings quite a number of people speak just as we went in one of the speakers was telling his experience and what a terrible struggle he had to overcome the power of appetite now when he felt a fearful craving coming over him he would walk the carpet till he had actually worn it threadbare but that he had been converted and found grace to help him in time of need and how he had gone out and tried to reform others and had seen the work prosper in his hand i watched joe's face it seemed lit up with earnestness and hope as if that man had brought him a message of deliverance then after the meeting came the signing of the pledge and joining the reform club and it would have done you good to see the men that joined do you remember thomas allison yes poor fellow and i think if any man ever inherited drunkenness he did for his father and his mother were drunkards before him well he joined and they have made him president of the club well did i ever but tell me all about joe when the speaking was over joe sat still and thoughtful as if making up his mind when miss gordon came to him and asked him to join he stopped a minute to button his coat and went right straight up and had his name put down but oh how the people did clap and shout well as joe was one of the last to sign the red ribbons they used for badges was all gone and joe looked so sorry he said he wanted to take a piece of ribbon home to let his wife know that he belonged to the reform club miss gordon heard him and she had a piece of black lace and red ribbon twisted together around her throat and she separated the lace from the ribbon and tied it in his buttonhole so as mary would see it oh miss bell did look so sweet and mr clifford never took his eyes off her i think he admires her very much i don't see how he can help it she is one of the dearest sweetest ladies i ever saw she never seemed to say by her actions i am doing so much for you poor people and you can't be too thankful not she and between you and me and the gate post i think that will be a match i think it would make a splendid one but hush i hear some persons coming the door opened and paul clifford joe goff and bell gordon entered here mrs goff said paul clifford as we children used to say here's your husband safe and sound and i will add a member of our reform club and we have come to congratulate you upon the event my dear friends i am very thankful to you for your great kindness i don't think i shall ever be able to repay you don't be uneasy darling said bell we are getting our pay as we go along we don't think the cause of humanity owes us anything yes said joe seating himself by the bedside with an air of intense gratification here is my badge i did not want to leave the meeting without having this to show you this evening said mrs goff smiling through her tears reminds me of a little temperance song i learned when a child i think it commenced with these words and are you sure the news is true are you sure my john has joined i can believe the happy news and leave my fears behind if john has joined and drinks no more the happiest wife am i that ever swept a cabin floor or sung a lullaby that's just the way i feel to-night i haven't been so happy before for years and i hope said mr clifford that you will have many happy days and nights in the future and i hope so too said joe shaking hands with paul and bell as they rose to go mr clifford accompanied bell to her door and as they parted she said this is a glorious work in which it is our privilege to clasp hands it is and i hope but as the words rose to his lips he looked into the face of bell and it was so radiant with intelligent tenderness and joy that she seemed to him almost like a glorified saint a being too precious high and good for common household uses and so the remainder of the sentence died upon his lips and he held his peace End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of sowing and reaping by francis c w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen 
i have resolved to dissolve partnership with charles said augustine romaine to his wife the next morning after his son's return from the champagne supper at john anderson's oh no you are not in earnest are you you seem suddenly to have lost all patience with charlie yes i have and i have made up my mind that i am not going to let him hang like a millstone on our business no if he will go down i am determined he shall not drag me down with him see what a hurt it would be to us to have it said don't trust your case with the romains for the junior member of that firm is a confirmed drunkard well augustine you ought to know best but it seems like casting him off to dissolve partnership with him i can't help it if he persists in his downward course he must take the consequences charles has had every advantage when other young lawyers have had to battle year after year with obscurity and poverty he entered into a business that was already established and flourishing what other men were struggling for he found ready made to his hand and if he chooses to throw away every advantage and make a complete wreck of himself i can't help it oh it does seem so dreadful i wonder what will become of my poor boy now mother i want you to look at this thing in the light of reason and common sense i am not turning charles out of the house he is not poor though the way he is going on he will be you know his grandfather has left him a large estate out west which is constantly increasing in value now what i mean to do is to give charles a chance to set up for himself as attorney wherever he pleases throwing him on his own resources with a sense of responsibility may be the best thing for him but in the present state of things i do not think it advisable to continue our business relations together for more than twenty-five years our firm has stood foremost at the bar ever since my brother and i commenced business together our reputation has been unspotted and i mean to keep it so if i have to cut off my right hand mrs romaine gazed upon the stern sad face of her husband and felt by the determination of his manner that it was useless to entreat or reason with him to change his purpose and so with a heavy heart and eyes drooping with unshed tears she left the room john said mr romaine to the waiter tell charles i wish to see him before i go down to the office just then charles entered the room and bade good morning to his father good morning replied his father rather coldly and for a moment there was an awkward silence charles said mr romaine after having witnessed the scene of last night i have come to the conclusion to dissolve the partnership between us just as you please said charles in a tone of cold indifference that irritated his father but he maintained his self-control i am sorry that you will persist in your downward course but if you are determined to throw yourself away i have made up my mind to cut loose from you i noticed last week when you were getting out the briefs in that sumter case you were not yourself and several times lately you have made me hang my head in the court-room i am sorry very sorry and a touch of deep emotion gave a tone of tenderness to the closing sentence there was a slight huskiness in charles voice as he replied whenever the articles of dissolution are made out i am ready to sign they will be ready by to-morrow all right i will sign them and what then set up for myself the world is wide enough for us both after mr romaine had left the room charles sat burying his head in his hands and indulging bitter thoughts toward his father to-day he said to himself he resolved to cut loose from me apparently forgetting that it was from his hands and at his table i received my first glass of wine he prides himself on his power of self-control and after all what does it amount to it simply means this that he has an iron constitution and can drink five times as much as i can without showing its effects and to-day if mr r n would ask him to sign the total abstinence pledge he wouldn't hear to it yes i am ready to sign any articles he will bring even if it is to sign never to enter this house or see his face but my mother poor mother i am sorry for her sake just then his mother entered the room my son mother just what i feared has come to pass i have dreaded more than anything else this collision with your father now mother don't be so serious about this matter father's law office does not take in the whole world i shall either set up for myself in a p or go west oh don't talk of going away i think i should die of anxiety if you were away well as i passed down the street yesterday i saw there was an office to let in fraser's new block 
and i think i will engage it and put out my sign how will that suit you anything or anywhere charlie so you are near me and charlie don't be too stout with your father he was very much out of temper when you came home last night but be calm it will blow over in a few days don't add fuel to the fire and you know that you and miss rowland are to be married in two weeks and i do wish that things might remain as they are at least till after the wedding separation just now might give rise to some very unpleasant talk and i would rather if you and your father can put off this dissolution that you will consent to let things remain as they are for a few weeks longer when your father comes home i will put the case to him and have the thing delayed just now charles i dread the consequences of a separation well mother just as you please perhaps the publication of the articles of dissolution in the paper might complicate matters when mr romaine returned home his wrath was somewhat mollified and mrs romaine having taken care to prepare his favourite dishes for dinner took the opportunity when he had dined to entreat him to delay the intended separation till after the wedding to which he very graciously consented again there was a merry gathering at the home of jeanette rowland it was her wedding night and she was about to clasp hands for life with charles romaine true to her idea of taking things as she found them she had consented to be his wife without demanding of him any reformation from the habit which was growing so fearfully upon him his wealth and position in society like charity covered a multitude of sins at times jeanette felt misgivings about the step she was about to take but she put back the thoughts like unwelcome intruders and like the ostrich hiding her head in the sand instead of avoiding the danger she shut her eyes to its fearful reality that night the wine flowed out like a purple flood but the men and women who drank were people of culture wealth and position and did not seem to think it was just as disgraceful or more so to drink in excess in magnificently furnished parlours as it was in low bar-rooms or miserable dens where vice and poverty are huddled together and if the weary children of hunger and hard toil instead of seeking sleep as nature's sweet restorer sought to stimulate their flagging energies in the enticing cup they with the advantages of wealth culture and refinement could not plead the excuses of extreme wretchedness or hard and unremitting drudgery how beautiful very beautiful fell like a pleasant ripple upon the ear of jeanette rowland as she approached the altar beneath her wreath of orange blossoms while her bridal veil floated like a cloud of lovely mist from her fair young head the vows were spoken the bridal ring placed upon her finger and amid a train of congratulating friends she returned home where a sumptuous feast awaited them don't talk so loud but i think belle gordon acted wisely when she refused mr romaine said mrs gladstone one of the guests do you indeed why charles romaine is the only son of mr romaine and besides being the heir he has lately received a large legacy from his grandfather's estate i think jeanette has made a splendid match i hope my girls will do as well i hope on the other hand that my girls will never marry unless they do better why how you talk what's the matter with mr romaine look at him now said mrs Falland, joining in the conversation this is his wedding night and yet you can plainly see he is under the influence of wine look at those eyes don't you know how beautiful and clear they are when he is sober and how very interesting he is in conversation now look at him see how muddled his eye is but he is approaching listen to his utterance don't you notice how thick it is now if on his wedding night he cannot abstain i have very grave fears for jeanette's future perhaps you are both right but i never looked at things in that light before and i know that a magnificent fortune can melt like snow in the hands of a drunken man i wish you much joy rang out a dozen voices as jeanette approached them oh jeanette you just look splendid and mr romaine oh he is so handsome oh jeanette what's to hinder you from being so happy but where is mr romaine we have missed him for some time i don't know let me seek my husband isn't that a mouthful said jeanette laughingly disengaging herself from the merry group as an undefined sense of apprehension swept over her was it a presentiment of coming danger an unspoken prophecy to be verified by bitter tears and lonely fear that seemed for a moment to turn life's sweetness into bitterness and gall in the midst of a noisy group in the dining-room she found charles drinking the wine as it gave its colour a right in the cup she saw the deep flush upon his cheek and the cloudiness of his eye and for the first time upon that bridal night she felt a shiver of fear as the veil was suddenly lifted before her unwilling eye and half reluctantly she said to herself suppose after all my cousin bell was right End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of sowing and reaping by francis c w harper 
this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen good morning mr clifford said joe goff entering the store of paul clifford the next day after he joined the reform club i've heard that you wanted some one to help you and i'm ready to do anything to make an honest living i'm very sorry said paul but i have just engaged a young man belonging to our club to come this morning joe looked sad but not discouraged and said mr clifford i want to turn over a new leaf in my life but every one does not know that do you know of any situation i can get i've been a bookkeeper and a salesman in the town of c where i once lived but i am willing to begin almost anywhere on the ladder of life and make it a stepping-stone to something better there was a tone of earnestness in his voice and an air of determination in his manner that favorably impressed paul clifford and he replied i was thinking of a friend of mine who wants a helping hand but it may not be after all the kind of work you prefer he wants a porter but as you say you want to make your position a stepping-stone to something better if you make up your mind to do your level best the way may open before you in some more congenial and unexpected quarter wait a few minutes and i will give you a line to him no i can do better than that he is a member of our club and i will see him myself but before you do had we better not go to the barber's i would like to said joe but i haven't haven't the money yes mr clifford that's the fact i'm not able to pay even for a shave oh what a fool i have been oh well never mind let the dead past bury its dead the future is before you try and redeem that if you accept it i will lend you a few dollars i believe in lending a helping hand so come with me to the barber's and i'll make it all right you can pay me when you are able but here we are at the door let us go in they entered and in a few moments joe's face was under the manipulating care of the barber fix this so said joe to the barber giving him directions how to cut his moustache paul was somewhat amused and yet in that simple act he saw a return of self-respect and was glad to see its slightest manifestations and it was pleasant to witness the satisfaction with which joe beheld himself in the glass as he exclaimed why mary would hardly know me suppose now we go to the tailor's and get some new rigging mr clifford said joe hesitatingly you are very kind but i don't know when i shall be able to pay you and oh never mind when you are able i will send my bill it will help you in looking for a place to go decently dressed so let us go into the store and get a new suit they entered a clothing store and in a few moments joe was dressed in a new suit which made him look almost like another person now we are ready said paul appearances are not so much against you good morning mr tennant said paul to the proprietor of a large store i heard last night that you wanted help in your store and i have brought you mr goff who is willing to take any situation you will give him and i will add he is a member of our reform club mr tennant looked thoughtfully for a moment and replied i have only one vacancy and i do not think it would suit your friend my porter died yesterday and that is the only situation which i can offer him at present i will accept it said joe if you will give it to me i am willing to do anything to make an honest living for my family well you can come to-morrow or stop now and begin all right said joe with a promptness that pleased his employer and joe was installed in the first day's regular work he had had for months what sitting up sewing said bell gordon entering the neat room where mrs goff was rejuvenating a dress for her older daughter why you look like another woman your cheeks are getting plump your eyes are brightening and you look so happy i feel just like i look miss gordon joe has grown so steady he gets constant work and he is providing so well for us all and he won't hear to me taking again that slop shop work he says all he wants me to do is to get well and take care of the home and children but you look rather pale have you been sick yes i have been rather unwell for several weeks and the doctor has ordered among other things that i should have a plentiful supply of fresh air so to-morrow as there is to be a free excursion and i am on the committee i think if nothing prevents i shall go perhaps you would like to go yes if joe will consent but but what well joe has pretty high notions and i think he may object because it is receiving charity i can't blame him for it but joe has a right smart of pride that way no i don't blame him i rather admire his spirit of self-reliance and i wouldn't lay the weight of my smallest finger 
upon his self-respect to repress it still i would like to see your mammy and hattie have a chance to get out into the woods and have what i call a good time i think i can have it so arranged that you can go with me and serve as one of the committee on refreshments and your services would be an ample compensation for your entertainment well if you put it in that light i think joe would be willing for me to go i will leave the matter there and when your husband comes home you can consult him and send me word and so you are getting along nicely oh yes indeed splendidly just look here this is joe's present and mary held up with both hands a beautifully embossed and illustrated bible this was my birthday present oh miss bell joe seems to me like another man last night we went to a conference and prayer meeting and joe spoke did you know he had joined the church no when did that happen last week has he become religious well i think joe's trying to do the best he can he said last night in meeting that he felt like a new man and if they didn't believe he had religion to ask his wife and suppose they had asked you what would you have said i would have said i believe joe's a changed man and i hope he will hold out faithful and miss bell i want to be a christian but there are some things about religion i can't understand people often used to talk to me about getting religion and getting ready to die religion somehow got associated in my mind with sorrow and death but it seems to me since i've known you and mr clifford the thing looks different i got it associated with something else besides the pall the hearse and weeping mourners you have made me feel that it is as beautiful and valuable for life as it is necessary for death and yet there are some things i can't understand miss bell will you be shocked if i tell you something which has often puzzled me i don't know i hope you have nothing very shocking to tell me well perhaps it is and maybe i'd better not say it but you have raised my curiosity and woman like i want to hear it now don't be shocked but let me ask you if you really believe that god is good yes i do and to doubt it would be to unmoor my soul from love from peace and rest it seems to me to believe that must be the first resting place for my soul and i feel that with me to doubt would be disloyalty to falter would be sin but my dear i have been puzzled just as you have and can say i have wandered in mazes dark and distressing i have had not a cheering ray my spirit to bless cheerless unbelief held my labouring soul in grief and what then i then turned to the gospel that taught me to pray and trust in the living word from folly away and it was here my spirit found a resting place and i feel that in believing i have entered into rest ah said mary to herself when bell was gone there is something so restful and yet inspiring in her words i wish i had her faith End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen i am sorry very sorry said bell gordon as a shadow of deep distress flitted over her pale sad face she was usually cheerful and serene in her manner but now it seemed as if the very depths of her soul had been stirred by some mournful and bitter memory your question was so unexpected and and what said paul in a tone of sad expectancy so unwelcome it was so sudden i was not prepared for it i do not said paul ask an immediate reply give yourself ample time for consideration mr clifford said bell her voice gathering firmness as she proceeded while all the relations of life demand that there should be entire truthfulness between us and our fellow-creatures i think we should be especially sincere and candid in our dealings with each other on this question of marriage a question not only as affecting our own welfare but that of others a relation which may throw its sunshine or shadow over the track of unborn ages 
permit me now to say to you that there is no gentleman of my acquaintance whom i esteem more highly than yourself but when you ask me for my heart and hand i almost feel as if i had no heart to give and you know it would be wrong to give my hand where i could not place my heart but would it be impossible for you to return my affection i don't know but i am only living out my vow of truthfulness when i say to you i feel as if i had been undone for love you tell that in offering your hand that you bring me a heart unhackneyed in the arts of love that my heart is the first and only shrine on which you have ever laid the wealth of your affections i cannot say the same in reply i have had my bright and beautiful day-dream but it has faded and i have learned what is the hardest of all lessons for a woman to learn i have learned to live without love oh no said paul not to live without love in darkened homes how many grateful hearts rejoice to hear your footsteps on the threshold i have seen the eyes of young arabs of the street grow brighter as you approached and say that's my lady she comes to see my ma'am when she's sick and i've seen little girls in the street quicken their face to catch a loving smile from their dear sunday-school teacher oh miss bell instead of living without love i think you are surrounded with a cordon of loving hearts yes and i appreciate them but this is not the love to which i refer i mean a love which is mine as anything else on earth is mine a love precious enduring and strong which brings hope and joy and sunshine over one's path in life a love which commands my allegiance and demands my respect this is the love i have learned to do without and perhaps the poor and needy had learned to love me less had this love surrounded me more miss bell perhaps i was presumptuous to have asked a return of the earnest affection i have for you but i had hoped that you would give the question some consideration and may i not hope that you will think kindly of my proposal oh miss gordon ever since the death of my sainted mother i have had in my mind's eye the ideal of a woman nobly planned beautiful intellectual true and affectionate and you have filled out that ideal in all its loveliest proportions and i hope that my desire will not be like reaching out to some bright particular star and wishing to win it it seems to me he said with increasing earnestness whatever obstacle may be in the way i would go through fire and water to remove it i am sorry said bell as if speaking to herself and her face had an absent look about it as if instead of being interested in the living present she was grouping amid the ashes of the dead past at length she said mr clifford permit me to say in the first place let there be truth between us if my heart seems callous and indifferent to your love believe me it is warm to esteem and value you as a friend i might almost say as a brother for in sympathy of feeling and congeniality of disposition you are nearer to me than my own brother but i do not think were i so inclined that it would be advisable for me to accept your hand without letting you know something of my past history i told you a few moments since that i had my day-dream permit me to tell you for i think you are entitled to my confidence the object of that day-dream was charles romaine charles romaine and there was a tone of wonder in the voice and a puzzled look on the face of paul clifford yes charles romaine not as you know him now with the marks of dissipation on his once handsome face but charles romaine as i knew him when he stood upon the threshold of early manhood the very incarnation of beauty strength and grace not charles romaine with the blurred and bloated countenance the staggering gait the confused and vacant eye but charles romaine as a young handsome and talented lawyer the pride of our village the hope of his father and the joy of his mother before whom the future was opening full of rich and rare promises need i tell you that when he sought my hand in preference to all the other girls in our village that i gave him what i never can give to another the first deep love of my girlish heart for nearly a whole year i wore his betrothal ring upon my finger when i saw to my utter anguish and dismay that he was fast becoming a drunkard oh mr clifford if i could have saved him i would have taken blood from every vein and strength from every nerve we met frequently at entertainments i noticed time after time the effects of the wine he had imbibed upon his manner and conversation at first i shrank from 
remonstrating with him until the burden lay so heavy on my heart that i felt i must speak out let the consequences be what they might and so one evening i told him plainly and seriously my fears about his future he laughed lightly and said my fears were unfounded that i was nervous and giving away to idle fancies that his father always had wine at the table and that he had never seen him under the influence of liquor silenced but not convinced i watched his course with painful solicitude all remonstrances on my part seemed thrown away he always had the precedent of his father to plead in reply to my earnest entreaties at last when remonstrances and entreaties seemed to be all in vain i resolved to break the engagement it may have been a harsh and hard alternative but i would not give my hand where my respect could not follow it may be that i thought too much of my own happiness but i felt that marriage must be for me positive misery or positive happiness and i feared that if i married a man so lacking in self-control as to become a common drunkard that when i ceased to love and respect him i should be constantly tempted to hate and despise him i think one of the saddest fates that can befall a woman is to be tied for life to a miserable bloated wreck of humanity there may be some women with broad generous hearts and great charity strong enough to lift such men out of the depths but i had no such faith in my strength and so i gave him back his ring he accepted it but we parted as friends for a while after our engagement was broken we occasionally met at the houses of our mutual friends in social gatherings and i noticed with intense satisfaction that whenever wine was offered he scrupulously abstained from ever tasting a drop though i think at times his self-control was severely tested oh what hope revived in my heart here i said to myself is compensation for all i have suffered if by it he shall be restored to manhood usefulness and society and learn to make his life not a thing of careless ease and sensuous indulgence but of noble struggle and high and holy endeavour but while i was picturing out for him a magnificent future imagining the lofty triumphs of his intellect and intellect grand in its achievements and glorious in its possibilities my beautiful daydream was rudely broken up and vanished away like the rays of sunset mingling with the shadows of night my aunt mrs rowland celebrated her silver wedding and my cousin's birthday by giving a large entertainment and among other things she had a plentiful supply of wine mr romaine had lately made the acquaintance of my cousin jeanette rowland she was both beautiful in person and fascinating in her manners and thoughtlessly she held a glass of wine in her hand and asked mr romaine if he would not honour the occasion by drinking her mother's health for a moment he hesitated his cheek paled and flushed alternately he looked irresolute while i watched him in silent anguish it seemed as if the agony of years was compressed in a few moments i tried to catch his eye but failed and with a slight tremor in his hand he lifted the glass to his lips and drank i do not think i would have felt greater anguish had i seen him suddenly drowned in sight of land oh mr clifford that night comes before me so vividly it seems as if i am living it all over again i do not think mr romaine has ever recovered from the reawakening of his appetite he has since married jeanette i meet her occasionally she has a beautiful home dresses magnificently and has a retinue of servants and yet i fancy she is not happy that somewhere hidden out of sight there is a worm eating at the core of her life she has a way of dropping her eyes and an absent look about her that i do not fully understand but it seems to me that i miss the old elasticity of her spirits the merry ring of her voice the pleasant thrills of girlish laughter and though she never confesses it to me i doubt that jeanette is happy and with this sad experience in the past can you blame me if i am slow very slow to let the broken tendrils of my heart entwine again miss bell said paul clifford catching eagerly at the smallest straw of hope if you can not give me the first love of a fresh young life i am content with the rich aftermath of your maturer years and ask from life no higher prize may i not hope for that i will think on it but for the present let us change the subject do you think jeanette is happy she seems so different from what she used to be said miss tabitha jones to several friends who were spending the evening with her happy replied mary gladstone don't see what's to hinder her from being happy she has everything that heart can wish i was down to her house yesterday and she has just moved in her new home it has all the modern improvements and everything is in excellent taste her furniture is of the latest style and i think it is really superb yes said her sister and she dresses magnificently last week she showed me a most beautiful set of jewellery and a camel's hair shawl and i believe it is real camel's hair 
i think you could almost run it through a ring if i had all she has i think i should be as happy as the days are long i don't believe i would let a wave of trouble roll across my peaceful breast oh annette said mrs gladstone don't speak so extravagantly and i don't like to hear you quote those lines for such an occasion why not mother where's the harm that hymn has been associated in my mind with my earliest religious impressions and experience and i don't like to see you lifted out of its sacred associations for such a trifling occasion oh mother you are so strict i shall never be able to keep time with you but i do think if i was off as jeanette that i would be as blithe and happy as a lark and instead of that she seems to be constantly drooping and fading annette said mrs gladstone i knew a woman who possesses more than jeanette does and yet she died of starvation died of starvation why when and where did that happen and what became of her husband he is in society caressed and looked on by the girls of his set and i have seen a number of managing mammas to whom i have imagined he would not be an objectionable son-in-law do i know him mother no and i hope you never will well mother i would like to know how he starved his wife to death and yet escaped the law the law helped him oh mother said both girls opening their eyes in genuine astonishment i thought said mary gladstone it was the province of the law to protect women i was just telling miss bassinket yesterday when she was talking about woman's suffrage that i had as many rights as i wanted and that i was willing to let my father and brothers do all the voting for me forgetting my dear that there are millions of women who haven't such fathers and brothers as you have no my dear when you examine the matter a little more closely you will find there are some painful inequalities in the law for women but mother i do think it would be a dreadful thing for women to vote oh just think of women being hustled and crowded at the polls by rude men their breaths reeking with whisky and tobacco the very air heavy with their oaths and then they have the polls at public houses oh mother i never want to see the day when women vote well i do because we have one of the kindest and best fathers and husbands and good brothers who would not permit the winds of heaven to visit us too roughly there is no reason we should throw ourselves between the sunshine and our less fortunate sisters who shiver in the blast but mother i don't see how voting would help us i am sure we have influence i have often heard papa say that you were the first to awaken him to a sense of the enormity of slavery now mother if we women would use our influence with our fathers brothers husbands and sons could we not have everything we want no my dear we could not with all our influence we never could have the same sense of responsibility which flows from the possession of power i want women to possess power as well as influence i want every christian woman as she passes by a grog shop or liquor saloon to feel that she has on her heart a burden of responsibility for its existence i hope my dear that a nation as well as an individual should have a conscience and on this liquor question there is room for woman's conscience not merely as a persuasive influence but as an enlightened and aggressive power mamma i think you would make a first-class stump speaker i expect when women vote we shall be constantly having calls for the gifted and talented mrs gladstone to speak on the duties and perils of the hour and i would do it i would go among my sister women and try to persuade them to use their vote as a moral lever not to make home less happy but society more holy i would have good and sensible women grave in manner and cultured in intellect attend the primary meetings and bring their moral influence and political power to frown down corruption chicanery and low cunning but mother just think if women went to the polls how many vicious ones would go i hope and believe for the honour of our sex that the vicious women of the community are never in the majority that for one woman whose feet turn aside from the paths of rectitude that there are thousands of feet that never stray into forbidden paths and to-day i believe there is virtue enough in society to confront its vice and intelligence enough to grapple with its ignorance End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen why mrs gladstone said miss tabitha you are as zealous as a new convert to the cause of woman suffrage we single women who are constantly taxed without being represented know what it is to see ignorance and corruption striking hands together and voting away our money for whatever purposes they choose i pay as large a tax as many of the men 
in a p and yet cannot say who shall assess my property for a single year and there is another thing said mrs gladstone ought to be brought to the consideration of the men and it is this they refuse to let us vote and yet fail to protect our homes from the ravages of rum my young friend whom i said died of starvation foolishly married a dissipated man who happened to be rich and handsome she was gentle loving sensitive to a fault he was querulous fault-finding and irritable because his nervous system was constantly unstrung by liquor she lacked tenderness sympathy and heart support and at last faded and died not starvation of the body but a trophy of the soul and when i say the law helped i mean it licensed the places that kept the temptation ever in his way and i fear that is the secret of jeanette's faded looks and unhappy bearing no jeanette was not happy night after night would she pace the floor of her splendidly furnished chamber waiting and watching for her husband's footsteps she and his friends had hoped that her influence would be strong enough to win him away from his boon companions that his home and beautiful bride would present superior attractions to anderson's saloon his gambling pool and champagne suppers and for a while they did but soon the novelty wore off and jeanette found out to her great grief that her power to bind him to the simple attractions of home were as futile as a roll of cobwebs to moor a ship to the shore when it has drifted out and is dashing among the breakers he had learned to live an element of excitement and to depend upon artificial stimulation until it seemed as if the very blood in his veins grew sluggish fictitious excitement was removed his father hopeless of his future had dissolved partnership with him and for months there had been no communication between them and jeanette saw with agony and dismay that his life was being wrecked upon the broad sea of sin and shame where is his father the child can't live it is one of the worst cases of croup i have had this year why didn't you send for me sooner where is his father it is now just twelve o'clock time for all respectable men to be in the house said the bluff but kind-hearted family doctor looking tenderly upon jeanette's little boy who lay gasping for breath in the last stages of croup oh i don't know said jeanette her face crimsoning beneath the doctor's searching glance i suppose he is down to anderson's anderson's said the doctor in a tone of hearty indignation what business has he there and his child dying here but doctor he didn't know the child had fever when he went out but neither of us thought much of it till i was awakened by his strange and unnatural breathing i sent for you as soon as i could rouse the servants well rouse them again and tell them to go down to anderson's and tell your husband that his child is dying oh no not dying doctor you surely don't mean it yes jeanette said the old family doctor tenderly and sadly i can do nothing for him let me take him in my arms and rescue dear little darling he will be saved from the evils to come just as his life was trembling on its frailest cords and its delicate machinery almost wound up charles romaine returned sober enough to take in the situation he strode up to the dying child took the clammy hands in his and said in a tone of bitter anguish charlie don't you know papa wouldn't you speak one little word to papa but it was too late the shadows that never deceive flitted over the pale beauty of the marble brow the waxen lid closed over the once bright and laughing eye and the cold grave for its rest had won the child End of chapter eighteen chapter twenty of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty if riches could bring happiness john anderson should be a happy man and yet he is far from being happy he has succeeded in making money but failed in everything else but let us enter his home as you open the parlour door your feet sink in the rich and beautiful carpet exquisite statuary and superbly framed pictures greet your eye and you are ready to exclaim oh how lovely here are the beautiful conceptions of painter's art and sculptor's skill it is a home of wealth luxury and display but not of love refinement and culture years since before john anderson came to live in the city of a p 
he had formed an attachment for an excellent young lady who taught school in his native village and they were engaged to be married but after coming to this city and forming new associations visions of wealth dazzled his brain and unsettled his mind till the idea of love in a cottage grew distasteful to him he had seen men with no more ability than himself who had come to the city almost penniless and who had grown rich in a few years and he made up his mind that if possible he would do two things acquire wealth and live an easy life and he thought the easiest way to accomplish both ends was to open up a gorgeous palace of sin and entice into his meshes the unwary the inexperienced and the misguided slaves of appetite for a while after he had left his native village he wrote almost constantly to his betrothed but as new objects and interests engaged his attention his letters became colder and less frequent until they finally ceased and the engagement was broken at first the blow fell heavily upon the heart of his affianced but she was too sensible to fade away and die the victim of unrequited love and in after years when she had thrown her whole soul into the temperance cause and consecrated her life to the work of uplifting fallen humanity she learned to be thankful that it was not her lot to be united to a man who stood as a barrier across the path of human progress and would have been a weight to her instead of wings released from his engagement he entered into an alliance for that is the better name for a marriage which was not a union of hearts or intercommunion of kindred souls but only an affair of convenience in a word he married for money a woman who was no longer young in years nor beautiful in person nor amiable in temper but she was rich and her money like charity covered a multitude of faults and as soon as he saw the golden bait he caught at it and they were married for he was willing to do almost anything for money except work hard for it it was a marriage however that brought no happiness to either party mrs anderson was an illy educated self-willed narrow-minded woman full of airs and pretensions the only daughter of a man who had laid the foundation of his wealth by keeping a low groggery and dying had left her his only heir john anderson was selfish and grasping he loved money and she loved display and their home was often the scene of the most pitiful contentions about money matters harsh words and bitter recriminations were almost common household usages the children brought up in this unhealthy atmosphere naturally took sides with their mother and their home was literally a house divided against itself the foolish conduct of their mother inspired the children with disrespect for their father who failed to support the authority of his wife as the mother and mistress of the home as her sons grew older they often sought attractions in questionable places away from the sombre influences of their fireside and the daughters as soon as they stood upon the verge of early womanhood learned to look upon marriage as an escape valve from domestic discomforts and in that beautiful home with all its costly surroundings and sumptuous furniture there was always something wanting there was always a lack of tenderness sympathy and mutual esteem i can't afford it said john anderson to his wife who had been asking for money for a trip to a fashionable watering-place you will have to spend the summer elsewhere can't afford it what nonsense is not it as much to your interest as mine to carry the girls around and give them a chance a chance for what why to see something of the world you don't know what may happen that english earl was very attentive last night to sophronia's at mrs jessop's ball an english count who is he and where did he spring from why he's from england and is said to be the only son and heir of a very rich nobleman i don't believe it i don't believe he is an earl any more than i am that's just like you always throw cold water on everything i say it is no such thing but i don't believe in picking up strangers and putting them into my bosom it is not all gold that glitters i know that but how soon can you let me have some money i want to go out this afternoon and do some shopping and engage this sempstress i tell you annette i have not the money to spare the money market is very tight and i have very heavy bills to meet this month the money market tight why it has been tight ever since i have been married well you may believe it or not just as you choose but i tell you this crusading has made quite a hole in my business now john anderson tell that to somebody that don't know i don't believe this crusading has laid a finger's weight upon your business yes it has and if you read the papers you would find that it has even affected the revenue of the state and you will have to retrench somewhere well i'll retrench somewhere i think we are paying our servants too high wages and anyhow mrs shenflint 
gets twice as much work done for the same money i'll retrench john anderson but i want you to remember that i did not marry you empty-handed i don't think i shall be apt to forget it in a hurry while i have such a gentle reminder at hand he replied sarcastically and i suppose you would not have married me if i had had no money no i would not said john anderson thoroughly exasperated and i would have been a fool if i had these bitter words spoken in a heat of passion were calculated to work disastrously in that sin-darkened home for some time she had been suspecting that her money had been the chief inducement which led him to seek her hand and now her worst suspicions were confirmed and the last thread of confidence was severed i should not have said it said anderson to himself but the woman is so provoking and unreasonable i suppose she will have a fit of sulks for a month and never be done brooding over those foolish words and anderson sighed as if he were an ill-used man he had married for money and he had got what he bargained for love confidence and mutual esteem were not sought in the contract and these do not necessarily come of themselves well the best i can do is to give her what money she wants and be done with it is not in her room no sir and her bed has not been rumpled where in the world can she be i don't know but here is a note she left what does she say read it annette she says she feels that you were unjust to the earl and that she hopes you will forgive her the step she has taken but by the time the letter reaches you she is, expects to be the countess of clarendon poor foolish girl you see what comes of taking a stranger to your bosom and making so much of him that's just like you john anderson everything that goes wrong is blamed on me i almost wish i was dead i wish so too thought anderson but he concluded it was prudent to keep the wish to himself john anderson had no faith whatever in the pretensions of his new son-in-law but his vain and foolish wife on the other hand was elated at the dazzling prospects of her daughter and often in her imagination visited the palatial residence of my son the earl and was graciously received in society as the mother of the countess of clarendon she was also highly gratified at the supposed effect of sophronia's marriage upon a certain clique who had been too exclusive to admit her in their set should not those gladstone girls be ready to snag themselves and there was that mary talbot did everything she could to attract his attention but it was no go my little sophronia came along and took the rag off the bush i guess they will almost die with envy if he had waited for her father's consent we might have waited till the end of the chapter but i took the responsibility on my shoulders and the thing is done my daughter the countess of clarendon i like the ring of the words but dear me here's the morning mail and a letter from the countess but what does it mean come to me i am in great trouble in quick response to the appeal mrs anderson took the first train to new york and found her daughter in great distress the earl had been arrested for forgery and stealing and darker suspicions were hinted against him he had been a body servant to a nobleman who had been travelling for his health and who had died by a lonely farmhouse where he had gone for fresh air and quiet and his servant had seized upon his effects and letters of introduction and passed himself off as the original earl and imitating his handwriting had obtained large remittances for which he was arrested tried and sent to prison and thus ended the enchanting dream of my daughter the countess of clarendon End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of sowing and reaping by francis e w harper this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one i cannot insure your life a single hour unless you quit business you are liable to be stricken with paralysis at any moment if once subject to the least excitement can't you trust your business in the hands of your sons doctor said john anderson i have only two boys my oldest went west several years ago and never writes to us unless he wants something and as to frank if i would put the concern into his hands he would drink himself into the grave in less than a month the whole fact is this my children are the curse of my life and there was bitterness in the tone of john anderson as he uttered these words of fearful sorrow well said the doctor you must have rest and quiet or i will not answer for the consequences rest and quiet said john anderson to himself i don't see how i am to get it with such a wife as i've always worrying and bothering me about something 
mr anderson said one of the servants mrs anderson says please come as quick as possible into mr frank's room what's the matter now i don't know but mr frank's acting mighty queer he thinks there are snakes and lizards crawling over him he's got the horrors just what i expected tell me about rest and quiet i'll be there in a minute oh what's the matter i feel strange said anderson falling back on the bed suddenly stricken with paralysis while in another room lay his younger son a victim to delirium tremens and dying in fearful agony the curse that john anderson had sent to other homes had come back darkened with the shadow of death to brood over his own habitation his son is dying but he has no word of hope to cheer the parting spirit as it passed out into the eternity for him the darkness of the tomb is not gilded with the glory of the resurrection the best medical skill has been summoned to the aid of john anderson but neither art nor skill can bind anew the broken threads of life the chamber in which he is confined is a marvel of decoration light streams into his home through panes of beautifully stained glass pillows of the softest down are placed beneath his head beautiful cushions lie at his feet that will never take another step on the errands of sin but no appliances of wealth can give peace to his guilty conscience he looks back upon the past and the retrospect is a worse than wasted life and when the future looms up before him he shrinks back from the contemplation for the sins of the past throw their shadow over the future he has houses money and land but he is a pauper in his soul and a bankrupt in his character in his eager selfish grasp for gold he has shrivelled his intellect and hardened and dried up his heart and in so doing he has cut himself off from the richest sources of human enjoyment he has wasted life's best opportunities and there never was an angel however bright terrible and strong that ever had power to roll away the stone from the grave of a dead opportunity and what john anderson has lost in time he can never make up in eternity he has formed no taste for reading and thus has cut himself off from the glorious companionship of the good the great and the wise of all ages he has been selfish mean and grasping and the blessing of the poor and needy never fall as benedictions on his weary head and in that beautiful home with disease and death clutching at his heart-strings he has wealth that he cannot enjoy luxuries that pall upon his taste and magnificence that can never satisfy the restless craving of his soul his life has been a wretched failure he neglected his children to amass the ways of iniquity and their coldness and indifference pierce him like poisoned arrows marriage has brought him money but not the sweet tender ministrations of loving wifely care and so he lives on starving in the midst of plenty dying of thirst with life's sweetest fountains eluding his grasp charles romaine is sleeping in a drunkard's grave after the death of his boy there was a decided change in him night after night he tore himself away from john anderson's saloon and struggled with the monster that had enslaved him and for a while victory seemed to be perching on the banner of his resolution another child took the place of the first-born and the dead and hope and joy began to blossom around jeanette's path his mother who had never ceased to visit the house marked the change with great satisfaction and prevailed upon his father to invite charles and jeanette to a new year's dinner only a family gathering jeanette being unwell excused herself from going and charles went alone jeanette felt a fearful foreboding when she saw him leaving the door and said to herself i hope his father will not offer him wine i am so afraid that something will happen to him and yet i hated to persuade him not to go his mother might think i was averse to his reconciliation with his father it looks very natural to have charles with us again said mrs romaine looking fondly on her son yes it seems like old times when i always had my seat next to yours and i hope said his father it will never be vacant so long again the dinner hour passed on enlivened by social chat and pleasant reminiscences and there was nothing to mar the harmony of the occasion mrs romaine had been careful to keep everything from the table that would be apt to awaken the old appetite for liquor but after dinner mr romaine invited charles into the library to smoke 
here said he handing him a cigar is one of the finest brands i have smoked lately and by the way here is some rare old wine more than twenty-five years old which was sent to me yesterday by an old friend and college classmate of mine let me pour you out a glass charles suddenly became agitated but as his father's back was turned to him pouring out the wine he did not notice the sudden paling of his cheek and the hesitation of his manner and charles checking back his scruples took the glass and drained it to the bottom there is a fable that a certain king once permitted the devil to kiss his shoulder and out of those shoulders sprang two serpents that in the fury of their hunger aimed at his head and tried to get at his brain he tried to extricate himself from their terrible power he tore at them with his fingers and found that it was his own flesh that he was lacerating dormant but not dead was the appetite for strong drink in charles romaine and that one glass awakened the serpent coiled up in his flesh he went out from his father's house with a newly awakened appetite clamouring and raging for strong drink every saloon he passed adding intensity to his craving at last his appetite overmastered him and he almost rushed into a saloon and waited impatiently till he was served every nerve seemed to be quivering with excitement restlessness and there was a look of wild despairing anguish on his face as he clutched the glass to allay the terrible craving of his system he drank till his head was giddy and his gait was staggering and then started for home he entered the gate and slipped on the ice and being too intoxicated to rise or comprehend his situation he lay helpless in the dark and cold until there crept over him that sleep from which there is no awakening and when morning had broken in all its glory charles romaine had drifted out of life slain by the wine which at last had bitten like an adder and stung like a serpent jeanette had waited and watched through the small hours of the night till nature or wearied had sought a repose in sleep and rising very early in the morning she had gone to the front door to look down the street for his coming when the first object that met her gaze was the lifeless form of her husband one wild and bitter shriek rent the air and she fell fainting on the frozen corpse her friends gathered round her all that love and tenderness could do was done for the wretched wife but nothing could erase from her mind one agonizing sorrow it was the memory of her fatal triumph over his good resolution years ago at her mother's silver wedding carelessly she had sowed the seeds of transgression whose fearful yield was a harvest of bitter misery mrs clifford came to her in her hour of trial and tried to comfort and sustain the heart-stricken woman who had tried to take life easy but found it terribly hard and she has miserably succeeded in the home of her cousin she is trying to bear the burden of her life as well as she can her eye never lights up with joy the bloom and flush have left her careworn face tears from her eyes long used to weeping have blenched the colouring of her life existence and she is passing through life with the shadow of the grave upon her desolate heart jogoff has been true to his pledge plenty and comfort have taken the place of poverty and pain he continued his membership with the church of his choice and mary is also striving to live a new life and to be the ministering angel that keeps his steps and he feels that in answer to prayer his appetite for strong drink has been taken away life with mrs clifford has become a thing of brightness and beauty and when children sprang up in her path making gladness and sunshine around her home she was a wife and tender mother fond but not foolish firm in her household government but not stern and unsympathizing in her manner the faithful friend and companion of her daughters she won their confidence by her loving care and tender caution she taught them to come to her in their hours of perplexity and trial and to keep no secrets from her sympathizing heart she taught her sons to be as upright in their lives and as pure in their conversation as she would have her daughters recognizing for each only one code of morals and one law of spiritual life and in course of time she saw her daughters ripening into such a beautiful womanhood and her sons entering the arena of life not with the simplicity which is ignorant of danger and evil but with the sterling integrity which baffles the darts of temptation with the panoply of principle and the armour of uprightness unconsciously she elevated the tone of society in which she moved by a life which was a beautiful and earnest expression of patient continuance in well-doing paul clifford's life has been a grand success not in the mere accumulation of wealth but in the enrichment of his moral and spiritual nature he is still ever ready to lend a helping hand he has not lived merely for wealth and enjoyment but happiness lasting and true springs up in his soul as naturally as a flower leaps into blossoms 
and whether he is loved or hated honoured or forgotten he constantly endeavours to make the world better by his example and gladdened by his presence feeling that if every one would be faithful to duty that even here eden would spring up in our path and paradise be around our way end of chapter twenty one end of sowing and reaping by francis c w harper